This is A Confused Heap of Facts, the podcast where we have a discussion about history with the faculty of the Department of Military History and the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, or U.S. Government. We are here with Associate Professor of Military History, Dr. Martin Clemmis, who's an expert on all things Vietnam. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Abel, and we also have in the room Professor Dr. John Hostler, uh, our medieval expert whose voice you may also hear. And today's topic is to examine the Vietnam War, and in particular to examine the Vietnam War uh, less from the perspective that we often see, particularly in American but generally Western media, which is focused on the, um, the belligerent powers from the West, and to look at that conflict, or rather series of conflicts, more from the Vietnamese perspective with Dr. Clemens. So thank you for being here with us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. So let's start with the kind of the beginning of the struggle. Uh, in, the, in the early 1940s, um, what is happening in the place we now call Vietnam? between French colonialism and then the um, not so much invasion but takeover by the Japanese during World War II. Okay, yeah, well, th well thanks. Um, yeah, essentially uh, Japan coming in really kind of as a game changer, right? Um, I mean, there had been, you know, Vietnamese nationalism really kind of gets, picks up significant steam at the end of the 19th century, but definitely during the early 20th century. Um, Nationalism is obviously tied in with anti-colonial movement, particularly pushback against uh, the French. Um, but kind of the, the, in, the indigenous resistance do doesn't really go very far, right? You have groups that are organizing um, nationalist, non-communist organizations. You also have the Indochina Communist Party, which was founded, I believe, in 1920. So you have this kind of mix of communist and non-communist uh, groups who were pushing back against French colonial rule. Um, organizing, uh, there are some some periods of unrest and kind of pushback rebellions, but they don't really go too far, right? But 1940 is really key for the fact that um, the Japanese uh, now turn their uh, eyes right after going into Manchuria and China um, southward into Indochina, and they push in in 1940. And essentially, what they do is they allow the now Vichy French regime, right, to remain kind of control of the day-to-day -day kind of administration of Indochina. Uh, but they're really kind of calling the shots militarily and using it for kind of a step off, uh, kind of a, a resource or a base, if you will, for their operations throughout the Pacific. So the French are still there. Uh, they're allowed to administer um, the, you know, the, the areas under their control from day to day. But the Japanese are really there, you know, in force with military uh, power. And this is something that creates an opportunity. Uh, for the Viet Minh, because it now draws in the American att attention of the United States, who through the OSS starts helping them uh, later in the 1940s. Uh, but even there, you're talking small uh, groups, um, the first quote-unquote propaganda teams, which would be the origins of what eventually became the People's Army of Vietnam, got their start now with uh, uh, Von Nguyen Giap uh, in charge. Uh, Ho Chi Minh is largely in China now. He's not really in Vietnam. Um, he doesn't return. Um, Oh, no, I guess it was, uh, he leaves in 1911, I think it's the early 40s is when he finally comes back and they're in the northern area called Viet Bac, the mountains along with the, with the uh, border with southern China. Um, so yeah. yeah, this is a period now where all kinds of other actors are getting in the mix now. You have the Chinese due to the nationalists, you got the Japanese involved, the French are there now, now the United States is casting its eye in this region as well too. Um, in an effort to uh, kind of help fight the Japanese or combat, if you will. But this is really a window of opportunity for the Viet Minh. And the, really the key thing for them, the key moment, comes really at the end. Because yes, they're, they're working with the OSS, rescuing down American pilots and doing some kind of small scale uh, kind of guerrilla actions against the Japanese, but nothing major really uh, too much. But what really happens is that um, after Japan starts flagging and there's a power vacuum, right? Essentially by summer of 1945, it's obvious that they're going to lose. 
Um, the French are keeping their eye, wonder what's going on, going to go on there as well too. But there was a key thing that happened. There was a famine in 1945, which was largely caused by the Japanese who had hoarded most of the rice and were holding, it, holding on to it for Japanese troops. Uh, and this was an opportunity for the Viet Minh now, now that the, the Japan was weakening somewhat, to actually go and kind of seize or quote unquote liberate that rice and distribute it to the population. And this is the one thing that really helped the Viet Minh build their street cred with the Vietnamese people themselves. So this was kind of a key opportunity for them. Um, also in the waning months, because of Japanese leaves, this is what allows um, Ho Chi Minh, Giap, and the Viet Minh, right, to now seize control and declare Vietnam free and independent in the August Revolution, which Ho Chi Minh famously on September the 2nd, I believe, goes up and announces Vietnam is now free and independent um, mm -hmm. in its own country. And that, of course, generates pushback from the French. Right, and the French uh, kind of initially agree, and then they're, they're buying space and time, right? They do. They do. What their initial uh, initially, yes. I mean, after we know their their performance in World War II was abysmal. They're looking to you know reconstitute their image, right, as a great power. Um, how would they do that? Uh, one way is to claim their you know reclaim their former colonies, right, if you will, or hold on to what they had, including Algeria, which is another hot spot, which kind of plays a small role though in this whole story. Um, but yeah, so initially the French are going to start coming in. The British actually uh, 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 help them and uh, allow Japanese, former Japanese prisoners, or Japanese prisoners, right, to serve as kind of police. And they start now allowing the French to come in, start, come, come back in. They start rearming them as well. Uh, but yeah, initially it was a series of negotiations in which France was now going to allow a quote unquote independent Vietnam to remain within the free French Union. Um, but really they wouldn't be calling any of the major kind of national security or military issues. So it was still pretty much kind of a pseudo-colonial kind of issue going on there. Uh, yeah. They have talks initially, the Fontainebleau talks they were talked about. Um, they break down. Um, French were not really willing to concede too much. Uh, and then as kind of a show of force, uh, and I think it's November 1946, they start shelling Haiphong, and uh, that kind of gets the ball rolling for the uh, first Indochina War, the franco Vietnam War, as it's called. Right, right. And then that transition period, if I'm remembering correctly, because the French are lacking military strength, the country, or, or actually at this point it's still three colonies, are occupied by both the nationalist Chinese and the British, yes, right? Yes, yes. Brits get out of there pretty quickly, right? But the, uh, the Chinese are lingering around for a little bit. Um, so yeah, you have all these actors and groups that are going on in there. They're not really in firm control, right? Um, it's one of the things that uh, they're allowed, given control, particularly in the urban areas. This is where one of the places that the Viet Minh went into. And part of the August Revolution, they created this uh, uh, the, the general offensive and general uprising that Les Juan later on implements, it was kind of largely based upon what happened during the August Revolution as well too, because part of it was that there were popular uprisings in the cities to kind of finally do away with the French colonial administration that was in these areas. So, um, so yeah, initially France wanted to have some kind of as I said, ostensibly independent Vietnam within the Free French Union, and they have talks about it. And this is one of these early talks, one of the things that will eventually uh, really lead to Ho Chi Minh and Giap's downfall, because they were seen by the hardliners as kind of weak and compromising. Um, Le Zuan, uh, uh, Le Dek Tho, uh, Nguyen Chi Tan, who was the other five-star general in uh, the North Vietnamese army, and Pham Hong, right? These guys, um, became friends, uh, particularly during the first, although they were all uh, um, you know, involved in the Indochina Communist Party in the 1920s and 1930s. Le Duc Tho and Le Zuan are were imprisoned for a, uh, a time being. Uh, Le Zuan was uh, uh, allegedly uh, tortured uh, by French authorities as well too. Uh, so these guys are the hardliners. And when uh, the franco Viet Minh War breaks out, they are in the South, right? And uh, they get put in the South in uh, Cochin China or the Mekong Delta. And so they were technically war buddies, these two. This is what really brought them together. They were fighting in the South. But when these talks uh, are prior to the, uh, you know, the franco Viet Minh War, when these talks were going on between the French government and Ho Chi Minh, um, this angered the hardliners because they felt that he was just too soft and too compromising. They felt they were in control. They should give nothing up because they already established their own independence. So this is the kind of seeds where you start seeing this, what becomes a kind of a full-blown schism within the Politburo over time. Okay, you, you've given us a lot of uh, very good kind of um, 
setup of what's happening and who all of the, the major players are. Uh, so let's start with kind of the big name people. Let's start by talking about Ho Chi Minh and Vo Wen Jop, who are kind of the, the ringleaders at the beginning, right? So, so who is Ho Chi Minh, and, and where is he coming from as a revolutionary? Okay, well, um, Ho Chi Minh was, uh, his father <clears throat> was a, a Mandarin, right, meaning he was educated and administrator, so he himself was exposed to, um, he was educated as a young individual. Um, his father um, allegedly killed someone when he was young, uh, and kind of as part of the fall, fallout of that, or kind of the embarrassment of that, he leaves Vietnam in 1911 and he travels abroad a number of different places, including Great Britain, the United States, um, served on a, he was a, a cook on a French liner, I believe, as, as, as it is. Uh, or a ship. Yeah, so, and he ends up infamously at Versailles in 1919, right? Yes, 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 yes. Um, and that's another thing when he's he's pushing now, because before he gets there, um, he's now increasingly interested in kind of Marxism, Leninism, and the tenets of that as well. He's being increasingly uh, drawn to it simply for its anti-imperial uh, aspect, right? I don't know when it was written, but Lenin's famous uh, uh, imperialism uh, tracked, uh, really attacking it and linking capitalism, global capitalism to imperialism and the need, you know, pegging it as a, a evil kind of institutions that work hand in hand that must be taken down. Uh, that start, you know, increasingly uh, uh, takes hold of uh, Ho Chi Minh and others, right, simply for the fact that it's, it, it ties together, right, anti-imperialism with kind of nationalistic, um, you know, aspirations as well, too. So. Um, he goes to Paris. He becomes a member of, I think, the Paris Communist Party, which later on, and he forms the, uh, I think it's Vietnamese Youth League. I, I could be wrong about the exact title of it, but he starts getting now in kind of an independence movement for uh, Vietnam, which he ties into the anti-colonial movement. And yes, he finds himself uh, in 1919 at Versailles, and he tries to petition, right? He's in very inspired by uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, kind of national determination, you know, Sentiments, what he's right. trying to push there, but you know, as we know, right, Wilson did not mean that for non-Europeans and non-Caucasians, right. right? So, uh, Ho Chi Minh and other uh, kind of developing world nationalists are just kind of brushed aside in that, and that's another thing that really brings him closer into the kind of Soviet orbit, if you right. Will. And if I'm remembering correctly, the 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 French communists weren't too interested either because they didn't really. I don't think they were in line with that idea of decolonization. I, like, I think they understood it, but I think they were more focused with domestic issues. So I think they also kind of brushed him off. Right, they were. And this is something that plays out um, also in France. You had a contest, right? Polit there was a lot of political instability after World War II in France. Uh, and the, the main actors were the French socialists and the uh, democratic, I'm trying to think, the Christian Democrats, I think they were. Yeah, so it's, it, the communists are the single largest party in the Fourth right. Republic for right. most of it, right? So then you have kind of the post Leon Bloom socialists, and he's still around. Okay. And then you have the Gaullists, who are kind of the, they're the hard right at that point. Right. And yeah, you have this whole constellation of people who are trying to put France back together, which for them, and, and oddly, in French history, the leftists tend to be the colonialists. Right, and that's what you saw. They were simply willing to go along during the Franco-Vietnam War. So despite their political differences, um, and uh, actually some disagreement over the war itself and kind of distaste, they still continue to go along with, with the French government's... Right, you know. right. And I can imagine being somebody like Ho Chi Minh, I, I believe he wasn't going by that name at the time, but I can imagine him being in France and being kind of frustrated by all of this. Right. Again, we, we can't wait around, you know, for these Europeans, the, 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 the white saviors, if you will, from Europe to kind of save us. This right. is something else that uh, kind of demonstrates, right, that if uh, true Vietnamese independence is going to be achieved, they're going to have to have a hand in it themselves. Right, right. That certainly makes sense. Um, so you had mentioned that, that uh, Ho Chi Minh had spent time in China, and I, I would assume he'd also spent time in Moscow. So he how did. does that relationship work? Yes, he went up there. He's a member of the Comintern, um, and the Comintern's job was to proselytize, if you will, communism throughout and, and, and spread the word of, uh, you know, Marxism, Leninism, and its benefits to uh, colonized peoples. So he, he had a relationship there as well, too. Okay. Uh, he allegedly spent some time in um, the province where the Long March ended. Uh, this is, I don't know the name of it uh, exactly, but he allegedly spent some time there as well, too. So he's fostering ties with the, uh, with the Chinese Communist Party, but then also 
um, with Moscow as well too, even though um, part of the later on so Sino-Soviet split is something that will play also loom large in this story as far as Ho Chi Minh and uh, Les Juan and the hardliners and the, the kind of more pragmatists, their their split that will play a role as well too over time. Right, right, and that's that's kind of an interesting aspect of all of this, right? It's Ho Chi Minh is you know he is the father of Vietnam, he's the father of the revolution, but it sounds like he didn't spend a whole lot of time there. No, no, I mean as a young guy, but then he's gone for thirty years and he finally comes back. But he's, I mean, he was committed to Vietnam, you know, true Vietnamese independence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he was a nationalist, right? There's been debate among historians for years. Was he a real nationalist? Was he a communist? Which one trumped which? And I don't think that, you know, you'll ever get a satisfactory answer to that. I think he was both. Yes, he was a nationalist, but he was also committed to global communism, right? And, and, and pairing those two. Um, and he was, you know, yes, he always wanted, you know, a, a free and independent Vietnam as a nation, right? But he also wanted to make that a communist nation too and never lost sight of that and I don't think was ever willing to compromise outside of that. But how to get there, right, that's another thing that brings him into conflict with Les Juan and the hardliners as well. Mm -hmm. He had more of a pragmatic, slow approach, if you will, where they were looking for more militant, more immediate. It always reminds me of like in the United States when you had abolitionists, right, in the run up to the Civil War, right? You had radical abolitionists, right, with full immediate emancipation, and then you had others who were more pragmatic over time through the political process. Yeah, the gradual kind of emancipation. That. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. No, that, that's, a, that's a good analogy. So if, if Ho Chi Minh is the one who's off meeting with Mao, meeting with, with eventually Stalin, uh, let's talk about Vo Win Jop back in, um, I guess, presumably, North Vietnam at this point. Right, right. So, so where is he coming from, and, and what's his relationship here? Okay, um, same thing. Uh, he was educated as a young guy. Um, he was uh, also attracted to leftist politics, as most, you know, a lot of uh, Vietnamese nationalists were at the time. Um, he, uh, he's really, his role is more as kind of Ho's, man on the ground, right? He's the guy who's also helping build a movement, but he's the guy who's now developing the military forces as well, too. Um, he's a pretty good strategist, right? Despite, I mean, he knew history, even though that's not what he was really trained to do. Is it, was he a history teacher? Am I remembering that He correctly? was a history teacher, yeah. He had a degree, which is, I think, an equivalent of a PhD um, in kind of modern PhD, but it wasn't in history. I forget what he was. It was more social science or something like that. Okay. I forget, and I forget what school he graduated from, but um, he was really also instrumental in organizing the movement as well, but particularly the, the military forces as well, too. So okay. that's what he's known for, is the kind of father of the People's Army of Vietnam, or the North Vietnamese Army. So okay. he's on the grounds, uh, you know, making things kind of happen in uh, northern China, and in, I'm sorry, northern Vietnam and southern China. He's operating in that Viet Bac mountainous region, building bases, training uh, guerrilla fighters, so on and so forth. So. Yeah, and the, the interesting thing about the, the uh, as the Vietnamese call it, the first Indochina War, right? So the war against France uh, that ends in 1954, it is almost exclusively fought in the north, correct? Yes, there's some activity um, down in Cochin, China, or the Mekong Delta, but for the most part, the, the bulk of the conflict is going on in the north, right? And also elements in, in Laos as well, too. Right, right. So we've got, so for the, for the war against France, we're largely talking about Hanoi, Haiphong, right. so the Red River Delta, right? Right. And then the areas to the north up to China. Right. And the areas west into what is now Laos. Yes. Yeah. Why, why is that? Why do we not see any fighting in, in the Anam colony, which is around Wei, or in right. the south around what, what is now Ho Chi Minh City, right. Saigon? Yeah, the, the, I mean, there is activity going on down there, and this is during the, uh, the franco Vietnamese War. This is where Le Zuan and uh, Le Dek Tho and the other two um, really, for, they, they're really war buddies. This is what really brings them together, right? Um, that's where their fighting was. They, they, st they are in the south in Cochin, China, fighting the French down there. So there is some activity down there, but most of the kind of large-scale conflict that we're, we're familiar with, including Xi Ben Phu, that takes place in the north due to kind of lines of communication, uh, the centrality of uh, Hanoi, how it plays in there. Because even still, Hanoi, because it's, it's so much older and it had been settled for so much longer, right? Yes, Annam is the cultural heart of Vietnam, if you will, because that's where the Nguyen emperors uh, had sat for so long, including there was a current one at the time. Um, 
so that was really more the cultural aspect, but really where most of the kind of uh, industry and, and political action was happening was really around Hanoi. That's the kind of area. Plus there were key lines of communication into um, Laos as well too. They also had their own kind of communist anti-colonial movements that were going on that the Viet Minh were making common cause with. Um, so, and, and the thing is, for the first four years of the franco Minh War, it doesn't really go much of anywhere, right? It's not much of a game changer. They, you know, uh, uh, Novin Jap and the Viet Minh are doing what they can, waging what kind of limited guerrilla activities they can. But really, it's not until 1949 in which um, Mao Zedong is victorious in China that now it's really a game changer, right? Because this is what allows uh, you know, China to now start devoting more sources or resources to uh, Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh and offer them kind of even safe haven there as well too. So this is the thing that really gets kind of outside intervention uh, into this uh, conflict, which has up to this point been uh, pretty much the Vietnamese and the French. But when I, and I say that too, I gotta be careful because also too, um, beginning in, uh, um, nine, 1949 as well, um, you had what was known as the Bao Dai Solution, right, or um, the Alesi Agreement, in which now um, the French uh, ostensibly give, again, right, give a uh, grant independence to Vietnam with uh, Bao Dai, the last Vietnamese emperor, as head. Um, <clears throat> So you have the state of Vietnam gets formed at that time. They have their own army, the Army of Vietnam, and that is now a Vietnamese army as well, too. So what you have now, this is when you get the beginnings of where this is really a civil war as well, too, because you have Vietnamese fighting for the French against a Vietnamese fighting for the Viet Minh as well. And then, of course, you have the, um, other international flavors as well, too, because uh, the French forces were, were largely not Frenchmen. They came from their other other colonies throughout the world. So you had people from all over the world that were fighting there as well. So it gets even more complex in, in, that, in that area as well, too. Yeah, yeah, I think you touched on some very important aspects of this kind of the, the first part of this, the Vietnamese independence struggle, which is it is immediately a multinational war, right? Yeah. Um, and it's also... You know, we're not going into a lot of the details of the kind of the internal politics, right? But there's a lot of competing groups in, you know, right. in in Hanoi, the administrative capital, in right. Wei, the, yes. the cultural capital in Saigon, which is kind of the tourist capital, right? Right. right. Yeah. So, and and you you mentioned the connection to China. So, what is what's the relationship of these Vietnamese revolutionaries to Mao and to okay. Mao's revolution? Well, they 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 like they love Mao, right? Because and Mao becomes more militant, right? Because um, also, when Mao comes to power, um, and then you have uh, the Korean War breaks out. Uh, Korean War, uh, Chinese support that. Um, the Vietnamese communists are very kind of inspired by that. They, they like that. But then uh, Stalin dies in 1953, and then Nikita Khrushchev becomes premier of the Soviet Union, and he starts advocating for uh, peaceful coexistence with the West, right? The idea that, yes, he still vowed to assist wars of national liberation, right, which he does 1960 when he makes that speech. But still, previous, you know, he's looking to you know, kind of ratchet back as part of the process of de-Stalinization, which was both an internal uh, process in the Soviet Union to try to walk back some of the murderous tendencies, right, of, uh, of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. Uh, but then also to put, you know, kind of a less... Um, militant face, if you will, for, for non-Western power. So he talks about peaceful coexistence, uh, working with the West, um, and for uh, Mao Zedong, that was called the Soviet heresy, right? This was, this was heretical, right? You cannot work with uh, the imperialist capitalists at all because it's the evil system. It must be taken down. The world must be made communism. That's how you're going to avoid conflict. That's how you're going to bring about you know, social justice on a global scale, if you will. So um, they're always attracted to um, Mao, but particularly after the Sino-Soviet split, when it really starts heating up and Mao becomes increasingly uh, militant in his approach and vowing to absolutely be the vanguard of world revolution and to push hard for that. Um, and that really resonates, particularly among the hardliners in uh, in, this, the, in Vietnam as well, too. Yeah, and this is all happening around the same time that the French are being defeated, right? 53, yes. 54? Right, but by that time, too, yeah. And it's the same thing. They're not... It's, the war is still even up to that point a stalemate, right? But it's becoming increasingly unpopular, uh, unpopular in France, right? They called it the dirty little war, right? They got issues in Algeria now as well, too. The political infighting in, in, in France, too. It's just starting to wear the French people down, the expense of blood and treasure for, for what end, right? 
uh, here in Indochina, right? So now you start seeing they're able to work on that, and that's the thing that sets up uh, kind of Xian Ben Fu. Um, Xiap is trying to do your kind of classic uh, three-stage Maoist guerrilla warfare or, 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 or protracted war, excuse me, strategy. Uh, his movement is growing over time. He's able. The, the thing was always the French were always strong, kind of in the urban areas. The Viet Minh were, were powerful in the countryside. That's where they're growing the movement. That's where they're through uh, land redistribution. Uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, confiscating land from from property landlords who were known to be collaborationists with the French, right? Uh, and redistributing that to individuals. So slowly over time. Um, Ho Chi Minh and Novin Jap are not even building political power in the countryside, but also military power as well to growing the kind of movement. Uh, however, in 1951, uh, Jiap famously or infamously launches a premature general offensive. He thinks it's uh, time for stage three. It gets beat back pretty hard. He kind of pulls back again. Uh, so you have this kind of pretty much stalemated throughout the war, right? But what happens is that at, by 1953, it's pretty obvious that uh, France is looking for some kind of negotiated settlement. Ho Chi Minh's willing to work for it, uh, but now they want to pair the kind of classic talking while fighting strategy, which is something they've always done, right? They're not looking for a true negotiated settlement. They're looking to, to do it. I mean, Ho Chi Minh is, the, the hardliners are not, right? But they're now pairing kind of uh, military offensives and operations with the ongoing peace talks. And they really time it with Geneva, and they do it perfectly because Dien Ben Phu falls just as the, the, uh, the talks are, are, are commencing, and they're able to use this to gain leverage and to eventually force France out. Yeah, you, you make an interesting point about this kind of the relationship with China where on the one hand, they absolutely need China, right? They need equipment, they need support. Right. Um, if I remember correctly, the Chinese send a bunch of trainers to teach the, the, the Viet Minh how to fight conventionally. Right. Later on, they even send engineers and uh, anti-artillery personnel. To right, man. right. But on the other hand, Jop has tried this three-stage Maoist strategy where you have your, your information phase, propaganda, then right. you move to guerrilla warfare, then you move to, to, I think they call it the war of movement, right? Right, right, yes. And it fails. Right. So now we know the Maoist construct isn't going to work. So they're in, this kind of, they're in this kind of transition place where they have to figure out their own style for their own conflict, right. but they still need Mao. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And this is where the Vietnamese uh, build upon Maoist warfare. And one of the key lessons, and, and particularly when, when Giap launches that premature um, war of movement or, 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 or uh, general offensive, um, is now they, they realize they have to adopt a much more flexible approach. And what they do is they're willing to go up and down, um, back and forth among those stages as necessary, right? And um, that's pretty much how the rest of the conflict uh, plays out, right? Um, uh, or I should say the, the, the uh, second Indochina War, uh, that's how that plays out, right? in which you have this kind of back and forth movement between the various three stages of Maoist warfare. Um, and often at any given time in any given year after even like 1964, um, this guy Philip Davidson, he was a, he, he's a historian, but he was also, uh, he was one of Westmoreland's, uh, I think it was Westmoreland's second in command. Um, or his chief of staff, I forget. He, he, he worked for Westmoreland technically, but he, he, he classified Vietnam as a mosaic war, quote unquote mosaic war, meaning that any, any given time in Vietnam, it could be stage one in one area, stage two in another, and stage three in even yet another area. And that, that you saw that mixture actually going on uh, all the time. And um, yeah, so this kind of modification of Maoist strategy, where it's not Progressive. Yes, they still believe that you were going to progress, right? Get increasingly stronger over time, or your enemy would get weaker. Um, they were very flexible in moving back and forth between those phases, right? So he, but they're still looking for him for aid and then kind of uh, uh, spiritual inspiration as well, too. Right. That certainly makes sense. Um, you, you've mentioned that that Ho Chi Minh is kind of increasingly at odds with a lot of the other revolutionaries, right? People right. like Lei Duan and Lei Duc Tho. Right. So, so tell us a little bit, let's start with Lei Duan. Um, what, how, what's his relationship to all of this? What's he doing during the war with France? Okay, well he's down in the south. He's down in uh, Cochin, China, uh, fighting the French there along with Lei Duc Tho. Um, he also becomes the head of what was something known as the Central Office of South Vietnam, which becomes later on the insurgency in the South. It's the headquarters for the insurgency in the South, even though it's largely directed from Hanoi. It's given its marching orders and everything. He's there. Uh, by 1957, though, however, he's acting party secretary. 
right? And this is where Le Ducteau comes in. Le Ducteau, uh, it was the organization committee, I believe was the name. It was a very powerful committee within the Politburo, right? And you're really talking about a dozen individuals or so, I think 11 or 12 people in the Politburo. Um, and he's the one that really helps facilitate and, 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 and steer, if you will, Les Zouan to power and while also marginalizing Ho and Giap and the kind of more moderate elements within the Politburo. So he's really critical as far as that goes. So um, Les Zouan is very ambitious, right? He doesn't believe in compromise, that compromise is weakness. As I said, uh, when initially those, those talks with France in 1946 puts Ho Chi Minh and Giap and the moderates in the kind of crosshairs of the more militant field, you, you shouldn't do that stuff. Geneva makes it even worse, right? They were saying, we were in control of so much uh, areas of the countryside. This was ridiculous to have, you know, surrendered so much to the French for this. Because as we know, right, um, this part of this uh, bow die solution of the Elysee Agreement that puts a, uh, the state of Vietnam with bow die as the head is that, um, he, in 1955, in 1954, he appoints um, Ziem as his prime minister. And Ziem the following year, uh, uh, seizes power in an in, in election um, in which he wins 98% of the vote or something like that. Yeah, completely I'm, legit. I'm doing election yes. in quotes. <laughs> yes, yes, a, legit, a completely legitimate election. But he wins that in 1955, declares himself president, and he has no intention of holding the elections that were part of the Geneva Agreements in 1954. Yeah, and so this agreement, for, for the listeners who aren't familiar with it, basically in 1954, the French washed their hands of Southeast Asia, Laos, Cambodia become independent, Vietnam is supposed to hold a unif unification election um, because it's divided uh, into northern and southern sections. Um, the North holds the election. I don't know. I don't know if we know if it's legitimate or not. I think it's generally considered to have been in the North. You know, I, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I mean, they they immediately move the the Viet Minh immediately move and they consolidate power. Right. Yeah. Right. As, as as legitimate as the, that kind of an election might be, right. but the Southern one is is very clearly rigged in favor of Ziem, right. who is this Catholic politician who is uh, in many ways the antithesis of most Vietnamese, but he is also Vietnamese. Ziem. Yes. Yes, and he's also uh, he is an ant. You know, he's a virulent. Uh, anti-imperialist and a nationalist himself too. So his credibility is just as his his bona fides, if you will, his anti-colonial nationalistic bona fides are just as uh, strong as Ho Chi Minh or any of the others. But as you point out, he was a Catholic. Um, he had this strange mishmash philosophy, personalism, I think it was called. He ran the, the government of South Vietnam. Um, with his brother, Nodzin Nu, who was kind of the, he ran the secret police and the other Strong arm, were, yeah. Strong arm, right? Now, there was a, 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 I mean, there's a reason for that, because simply when, when this happens, right, um, South Vietnam, or the Republic of Vietnam, right, it's kind of technical name, is a basket case, right? Because you have not only communists who didn't go north as part of the Geneva Accords, but you had three sects, religious, political sects, which were in the south, um, who each had their own militias, they each had their own, one had their own pope, I forget if that was the Wa Hao or the Cao Dai, but you also had the Bin Zuen, who was also kind of like a mafioso group down there. So you had groups immediately that were not gonna, did not wanna go along with any kind of national government, and they were not gonna be, you know, mm -hmm. so they, they immediately pushed back against uh, ZM's government, then meanwhile you still have communist agitators who are down there. Not a lot, and they're not really organized, they don't have their act together yet, but still, South Vietnam is very, Divide, you know, divided politically. So they resort to police tactics to really rein in these groups. He does manage to do that, to, to get these sects under control. Also launches something called the, the Denounce the Communist Campaign, which was kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, it really pushes the Southern insurgency to the brink of extinction, uh, but because it casts such a large net, it, it tends to alienate a lot of South Vietnamese who were not involved in the communist movement at all. It's one thing that was tied to the um, to the Buddhist uprising right, and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah, well. it's kind of he kind of roughhoused a lot of the Bo Buddhist I, if pagodas. I think is the right term. Yes, yes, which wasn't good. Now, um, although the, there's controversy over the book, right? Um, Mark Moyer has shown, and I think pretty pretty good job at it, that the the, the Buddhists were not completely just purely speaking out against their treatment, right? That they had been 
uh, infiltrated or at least out sympathetic to uh, the Viet Minh and their push as well, too. So, yeah, some leftist or, tendencies. Uh, right, yes, yeah. exactly. Or not the Viet Minh. I guess the Viet Minh don't exist really anymore at this point. But yeah, so there's some element of that uh, as well, too. But still, uh, ZM's uh, hard-handed tactics definitely without a doubt. Right, right. So we're in this transition period. Yeah, we're in this transition period now where we go from, uh, you know, the French are out 54. Yeah. The, the U.S. is still invested in, in the Republic of Vietnam. Right. The, the communists in the North are consolidating, right. as well as communists in the South are consolidating, too. Right, right? right. And then in the early 1960s, we kind of set up for the second phase or the second war. Right, right. Uh, so how, how do we go from this kind of settlement period where we're sorting out borders, we haven't fulfilled Geneva, okay. how do we go from there to outright war again by the mid-60s? Okay. Um, well, yeah, part of Geneva, uh, one of the main things is that, yes, it partitions Vietnam at the 17th parallel with what they called regroupment. regroupment. And, like, why would they do that? Simply for the fact that Due to the nature of the war, and as we said, Vietnamese fighting Vietnamese, right, all intermixed, right, some fighting for the French, some fighting for the Viet Minh, all intermingled. They said, all right, we need you to go back to your respective corners to try to hash this out. So they divide it at the 17th parallel, um, and that's where the communists were supposed to go north, the non-communists to go south, including, uh, I think it was two million Catholics who also went down south as well, too, right? But it was the idea of, like, go back to your respective corners, and we'll hash this out in the future with those elections in 1956. Um, to backtrack just a little bit, we talked about the United States, right? They get involved uh, in 1950 as well, too. After this quote unquote Bao Dai solution, right, in which the state of Vietnam is created with uh, Bao Dai, the emperor's head, this is what allows the United States finally to say, all right, this is no longer a pure colonial issue, right? Because they were, they were disturbed by, you know, they, they they were, you know, committed to the Cold War prior to that, right? They would have wanted to fight communism, but they still did not like the idea of, you know, a actively helping France just reassert its colonial control. This Bao Dai solution kind of pay, does away with those with those reservations, right. right? So this is what now allows the United States beginning in 1950 to start giving aid directly to the French, right, to, to fight the Viet Minh. Um, and I think it's by, I'm trying to think, that's 1950. By 1954, I think the United States is underwriting about 80 percent of the of France's war effort. Yeah, I've, I've seen the war. between 80 and 95 percent. Right, yeah. right. Plus a, a lot of the heavy lift, too. It, yeah, right, exactly. So, and this is the thing now, Ho Chi Minh starts looking at this, and he wants, he's, he now realizes that the United States could be a bigger threat, right, than France is, right? Um, so for him, and this is one of the reasons why he starts then negotiating with the French as well, too, is yes, he wants to negotiate a settlement, he's willing to have one, but he really ha always has his eye on the United States to keep them the hell out of this conflict, right? Um, as we know, it doesn't happen. They start giving aid in, but they don't intervene, right? You have, um, you know, ZM is president in 1955, he's cracking down on things. Um, but for Ho Chi Minh and the more moderates in the Politburo, they were fine. They, they, wanted to, they were fine now with what's going on in the South, right, even though the communists were getting kind of crushed by the denounced the communist movement by ZM, because they want to implement what was known as a, a North First policy, right? When you're talking the fighting is up in Tonkin, it's in around Hanoi, they wanted to rebuild the country, kind of build, build socialism, quote unquote, if you will. So they need to get their economy, their infrastructure was in shatters, in, in tatters, so they really want to devote their energies toward rebuilding the North, building socialism, building communism in the North, will liberate the South later. And this is another point of contention between Les An, Les Ducteau and the hardliners, and Ho Chi Minh and Giap on the more moderate pragmatists, right? The hardliners, we don't want to wait for national liberation. We should liberate the South through force rapidly and quickly. Um, Ho and the moderates do not want to do that. So they, they're rebuilding in the north. Um, there were some rebellions against the regime. They quickly kind of clamped those down. Um, but what happens is that over time, ZM starts kind of losing ground in the south. This is something else that starts paving the way. Um, the United States continues its aid, but now to the South Vietnamese regime, right? Nation building, if you will. Uh, on one hand, they're trying to help the South Vietnamese build their own army, which they have now, the Army of Vietnam, which went from um, 
which got its origins, as I said, with the state of Vietnam under Bao Dai, but now they have their own army. So that was one aspect of it. The other aspect was kind of uh, nation building in the countryside, right? Making sure that you get the population on your side by building strong kind of uh, institutions and infrastructure, political and economic infrastructure in South Vietnam as well, too. So now we increasingly start giving aid to uh, ZM in the South, who plays the Americans kind of beautifully. He gets what he needs. It wasn't a, a good kind of relationship, but nonetheless, right, due to now the, uh, you know, the, the, the Cold War is really heating up, the United States is going to do what it needs to do to try to prevent uh, South Vietnam from falling, as we know, the, the domino effect. That was the whole kind of theory, right? If South Vietnam or if Indochina falls, then all the other areas uh, uh, in Southeast Asia could possibly fall as well, too, and then we will get kind of pushed out of that area. So the United States commitment gets starting get starts to get uh, heat or, or, get, or heats up during this period as well, too. Um, but one key moment really comes in Lei Zhuang is acting secretary in 57. In 60, uh, they have uh, the third party Congress in which now he is made the party secretary. He's not in full control of anything, but he is now the head of the Politburo by 1960. Um, also in 19, uh, about 1960, the National Liberation Front gets formed, right? The official insurgency in the South. Um, something called Resolution um, 15 gets passed, meaning we're going to now step up um, kind of anti-government agitation and guerrilla activities in the South. They didn't want to push too hard, right? And Lei Zuan and the hardliners are not able to do things yet. They start violating, right? Ho Chi Minh and Jap are pushing. Yes, you could do some kind of activities in the South because we're losing ground with ZM's denounce the communist campaign. So you could do some things, but not too much. But Lei Zuan encourages the hardliners in the South, ignore that, right? So they do start on their own stepping up kind of guerrilla activities. Um, in 63, there's something known as the Battle of Ap Bak, right? It's kind of an infamous battle um, portrayed by um, in um, Neil, was it? Neil Sheehan's A Bright Shining Lie about John Paul Van. But this is really an embarrassment for the United States. But it's obvious now that the, despite years of nation building now, right, because um, you move from the Eisenhower to the Kennedy administration, who was even more committed, right, to, to preserving South Vietnam. Uh, despite, you know, all this aid from the United States training their armed forces, they get, their regulars get beat up by a couple of North Vietnamese, or excuse me, by uh, the National Liberation Front or Viet Cong uh, regiments, right, who are really good fighters, right, by this point as well, too. So this is really embarrassing to the United States, and we're really wondering what the hell is going on here, right? But um, Kennedy is committed to preserving South Vietnam. Um, and the insurgency is gaining ground um, in the countryside. But based upon that and based upon other things, um, ZM is assassinated, right, in uh, 1963. One of the issues is that uh, there was a number of coups against him when he was president, right, these military coups to get him from power. You also had fa elements in the United States, some who loved ZM, right? He was called the Miracle Man by certain elements, right, in Washington. But others were very suspicious of this guy, did not like his hard-handed tactics, knew he did not have much popular support in the countryside due to his, his Catholicism and some of his... Uh, uh, actions, right, that were going on, is his lack of kind of land reform. The National Liberation Front is still able to, to, you know, grow its movement through redistributing land in areas under its control, really prevent government from, you know, establishing, uh, the Saigon government from establishing control everywhere. So there's a lot of uncertainty about ZM, right? Not only is his own, own country unrest, pushback, there's student protests, there's Buddhist protests, but also here in the United States, you start seeing all, they see, see this unrest, see that ZM simply can, cannot get a control, a, a handle on the situation. So when coups were floated in the, in the past, the United States pretty much said, we're not gonna be on board with this. But uh, in 63, when the buzz about another coup is gonna be announced, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was our ambassador there at the time, he's very anti-ZM. Uh, so he kind of, they discuss it um, with the Kennedy administration, and essentially Kennedy also increasingly, and, Ma and Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, are also increasingly uh, wondering what the hell is going on in South Vietnam. So when this announcement of a new coup comes in, uh, they, they don't green light it and say, go for it. But they essentially say, if this happens, we're not going to step in, right? Right. So in November of 63, um, ZM is assassinated. Three weeks later, Kennedy is assassinated. And this now is what uh, sets up the stage for uh, the second Indochina war, for a war against the United States. Because what happens is after ZM is assassinated, South Vietnam devolves into just absolute chaos, right? Political chaos. 
Um, the uh, National Liberation Front, the insurgency is really pushing forward, right? They're starting to move out, uh, push government, you know, seize increasingly large uh, control of larger swaths of South Vietnamese territory. Yeah, and there's uh, no, if I remember correctly, there's no local control, right? The, the Saigon government just can't control the countryside. It simply can't, right? They, it's, uh, you know, they, part of what the communists were able to do so beautifully is to, to eliminate, right? They established a shadow government, the Viet Cong infrastructure, it was called, right? Who was able to really mirror the South Vietnamese government, as they did under the French, right? The French called it parallel hierarchies, right? But under the, the um, Republic of Vietnam, they established kind of the shadow government who are embedded everywhere. So they were able to, through a terrorist and assassination campaign, and uh, to eliminate kind of civil servants. So the, 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 the links between Saigon, the central government, and the countryside was always weak. They make some efforts, right? ZM puts in the strategic hamlet program to try to, you know, get people on board. But it was always kind of weak, the, the, the bonds between the, the central government and the, and the popula population overall. And this is vastly overwhelmingly peasants, right, in South Vietnam who, who farm the land always tenuous at best, right? So this does not help, and this is what allows, again, the National Liberation Front to take advantage of this instability in the South after ZM is assassinated to really start gaining and making, you know, making uh, gains. Meanwhile, back in Hanoi, this now is where um, Le Zuan and the hardliners seize control. They seize control of the military policy from Ho Chi Minh, who are now, him and Giap are really marginalized. They passed something called Resolution 9 at the Ninth Party Plenum. Um, in 1964, and that essentially calls for now the liberation of the South, right? Stepped up armed struggle to liberate the South, and this is what sets the stage for the United States. Because as they push forward, they start making gains. Uh, in September of 64 is when you have North Vietnamese Army regulars now infiltrating into the South to try to deliver a knockout blow to uh, the Arvin, uh, the Army of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese military. Uh, also, one of Le Zuan's, uh, his big modification to the Maoist warfare is something called the General Offensive and General Uprising Strategy. And that paired together uh, military offensives in the countryside, right, the rural areas, with popular uprisings in the cities, something they saw in the August Revolution in 1945. And the whole idea of an uprising is this whole kind of it had almost like mystical proportions to it, the way it was looked at. That you would have these the military and the people coming together, right, in two different areas, two different tasks, but forming this synergy, which would just completely collapse the Saigon regime in a very rapid kind of fashion. So you defeat their armed forces, popular uprisings in the city to to strip power from any of the the government kind of administrators in that area, and you have the revolution fulfilled, if you will. So 64 is really the year then that Le Duan and his supporters take control from Ho Chi Minh and, right. and Job. Right. It's really a watershed. This is the pivotal moment which leads us down to, to the path to war with the, or leads the Vietnamese down to the path of war with the United States. Was Le Duan seizing power, Resolution 9, and then the, just, you know, the progress of this com the communist efforts in the South. Right. So uh, Ho Chi Minh by this point is, is elderly and he's not he's not going to be around for much longer, right? Yeah. So he's just kind of a talisman from here on out? No, he's still he's still there. Uh, he's marginalized, right? And the thing about Le Zuan and Le Duc Tho and the hardliners, uh, they're, they, 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 they clean house, right? Once they're in charge, they start purging, right? Uh, anybody from the moderate, anybody that opposed them or any uh, people from the moderate camp. They don't kill them all. There's a few I think they do kill, right? But people like Ho Chi Minh, uh, they absolutely need him because he is still the face of the revolution, right? Especially on the international stage, right? And this is the thing. They have all these struggles, right? They have military struggle, obviously, uh, what they call armed struggle, uh, military action, guerrilla warfare, violence and assassination, kind of agitprop at the local level. Uh, they had a political struggle, right, which was largely propaganda campaigns aimed at various different audiences. Uh, but they also had this diplomatic struggle as well, too. They were always looking globally, right, not only for, you know, fellow communist countries, the Soviet Union and uh, the People's Republic of China to give them aid, but just other kind of uh, uh, audiences in the international world. One of them were fellow communist movements, obviously, who were, you know, brethren in the fight of world revolution, but also non-communist um, colonial regimes as well, too, uh, or anti-colonial movements as well. Hey, you might not be communist, but you know what? we're on the same page as far as, you know, toppling imperialism, right, this kind of evil system, right? So they really start pushing that as well to this diplomatic initiative uh, in the world. And also, uh, like, 
elements in the West that would be sympathetic to their plight, right? So uh, Ho Chi Minh is very uh, instrumental in that. He is still the face of the revolution. He's very important as far as that image. And that's another thing that um, the Vietnamese communists just do so well. They keep this image of who is, you know, the kind of just war concept. Who's fighting for justice? Who is fighting for against justice, right? Who is good in this fight? Who is bad? Who is the war criminals? Who are those that are fighting kind of oppression and tyranny? Uh, and Ho Chi Minh is still very valuable. So he's there. He's not, Lei Zuan and the hardliners, they're firmly in control. They're making the military policy uh, and this kind of liberate the South policy. Um, but Ho Chi Minh is still important to the party as far as having that popular image on the world stage, softening the kind of what's really going on. Okay. What, what about Jop, this kind of victor against France? What's his role now? Um, not much. He still has, uh, you know, say, right? He's still a, m a member of the Politburo, um, still has input in military operations. However, uh, Nguyen Chi Tan, who is Le Zuan's five star, right? He is uh, increasingly taking a harder, you know, a much more prominent role in the military operations. Um, however, he dies under mysterious circumstances in 1967. This is something that him and Giap were rivals, something that really now leads to hardcore purges of the Politburo and anybody that was deemed to be uh, uh, opposed to what the hardliners were wanting to do. So serious crackdown after um, uh, Nguyen Chi Tan dies in 1967. Um, Giap still manages to hang on. He has some degree of influence. He still... Uh, I forget if uh, he, he, he had some planning, I believe, in the Tet Offensive uh, and also the 1972 Easter Offensive, but still not so much. He still has input, but it's still, it's the hardliners who are really dictating all the policy. So is there, is there another military figure who steps forward to replace he and uh, Wen Shi Tan, or is it just kind of a, a group of people? It's really kind of like a, a concerted effort, if you will, like a corporate effort among the Politburo and the hardliners. Okay. Uh, and, and you've mentioned Pham Hung a couple of times. What's right. his role in all of this? Um, he, he has military responsibility. I'm not exactly sure what, but he's, he's involved in the political aspect. Is, I mean, sorry, the military uh, aspect of, of the conflict as well, too. Um, I believe that he, is, uh, he becomes the head of the Central Office of South Vietnam after Nguyen Chi Tan is assassinated. Or, I'm sorry. Dies allegedly assassinated. We're doing air quotes. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, uh, and that was uh, Lei Zuan's initial thing. And as I said, that is the the headquarters and the and the, the the driving force for the insurgency in the South. Right. Yes, the North is feeding it and giving it its orders, which it translates. But still, um, Hanoi is in charge of the uh, communist war effort in the northern portion of South Vietnam, and the Central Office of South Vietnam is responsible in the southern half. So. Uh, Pham Hung becomes head of the Central Office of South Vietnam after Nguyen Chi Tan dies in 1967. So is he, are, is he physically present in the South or is he directing it from Hanoi? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm not really 100% sure. Um, I know after uh, regroupment in 54, those guys still hang around in the South, right? But then eventually they, right. they come up to Hanoi. But wh whether or not they're, they're present now. And the thing about the Central Office of South Vietnam, that was in Cambodia. That was one of the, the, the justifications for the United States incursion into Cambodia into, into 1970 was to find the Central Office of South Vietnam because that's a great place to keep it, right? Because right. You know, Cambodia and Laos were... were were off limits due to their quote unquote right yeah neutrality. And they have, they have right. their own issues with this stuff right so right they have they communist do. groups in both countries fighting right right right, right right yeah yes and I believe at one point I think in, in in is it in Laos where you have two different communist groups fighting each other or or Cambodia is there's some it's very confusing it is it is very confusing this this is such a multi layered and complex conflict. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. But yeah, there are multiple groups, multiple actors in both Laos and Cambodia, um, and including uh, power struggles between communists and anti-communists for control of, of the government. Right. Right. So okay. So it's 1964. Okay. The hardliners are in charge. How is this war prosecuted against the Republic of Vietnam and the United States? Okay. Um, it's really essentially a hybrid war, right? They 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 love dividing things into three, right? Um, once it's engaged, the same thing. Really, Hanoi's strategy is just to deny the Americans from achieving their objectives. Just prove to them they simply cannot win, right? Break their will. They're, again, they're going back to kind of Mao's protraction of the war, right? Um, stretch it out over time, wear out the Americans, right? Um, 
they knew that there's an anti-war movement, they play on that. They know that there's international opposition to the war, they play on that. They know the weaknesses that are inherent in democracies, uh, particularly when you have two parties, right, constantly competition for one another. Right. That if you can man manipulate that, that's an opening for you as well, too. So really for them, their whole strategy is predicated, now that the Americans are involved, again, right, it was during the French, let's try to keep the Americans from possibly getting involved. When they were going against No Dien Diem, um, same thing. Let's let's get them quick, right? Let's let's keep the let's not push too hard, right? Because we don't want the Americans to get involved. But then once you had Resolution 15 and then Resolution 9, they said let's deliver a knockout blow before the Americans can get even get involved, right? As we know, American combat forces, ground forces at least, uh, come in in March of 1965. So now once they're there and it switches from what they used to call what they called special war, which is a war against proxy, they thought you know. With, against the South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese regime to now limited war with the Americans are here. So their whole strategy is built upon the idea of just, just deny them to achieve what they want to do, right? Inflict whatever pain that you can on the South Vietnamese government, um, the South Vietnamese army, and the Americans, right? Prevent the Saigon government from being able to really consolidate control, gain control of large swaths of area, um, to get the people aligned with them. Do what you can to deny them what they're looking for, um, wear them out, and then they'll eventually leave. Okay, and what role do uh, China and the Soviets play in this? You mentioned the Sino-Soviet split, so right. how is that factoring? Right. Um, they, at varying different times, uh, give uh, the Hanoi regime the aid that it needs. Right? Initially, uh, China's, uh, uh, China is, uh, well, initially when they're fighting the French, right, uh, Ho appeals to Moscow for aid. But Stalin is very cool. He's not very willing to go along to do this. Um, after 1949 and Mao and the CCP comes to power, he's a little bit more willing now too, right? Because you can't be outdone, right? In right. a revolutionary zeal, these, these two are kind of competing for one another, right? So he now he's willing to give some aid. China's giving a large bulk of aid. Uh, as we talked about before, Khrushchev comes in, peaceful coexistence, right? Um, China now, we're going to, you know, this, this Soviet heresy cannot stand. We're really going to help you you know, would step up. So now China's devoting most of the aid. Um, Khrushchev uh, is eventually uh, gone in 1964, right? Uh, Leonid Brezhnev comes in. He's a hardliner, so again, he can't get outdone by uh, by Mao and, and their kind of more militant aspect of world revolution. So they start giving aid as well, too. Um, then there's reproachment later on, right? When Nixon comes into office, right? Um, now you have not only Moscow, uh, sorry, China, but Moscow also hoping to uh, gain greater uh, detente or, or rapprochement with the West. Um, and Hanoi is very concerned about this, but they're still able to play off and get what they need when they need it. Um, and even after that fact, it's really by 1972 where the Soviets really step up to the plate now, right? Because China is more interested, right? The Cultural Revolution is already kind of common enough it's gone, and I'm not sure how long it lasted, right? But they're looking to make stronger ties. I mean, yes, Brezhnev is too with the, with the Americans, but so now you have the Soviets step in. So it kind of, you know, ebbed and flowed throughout based upon who was in charge, what given time period, but Hanoi was able to really manipulate the two and get what they needed all the way to the end. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier this, this strategy of talking while fighting. Right. So how does that work? Um, essentially, again, it ties into protracted war strategy. It was never, um, ever entertained the idea of a true negotiated settlement. It's to just talk and push for military victories in the time being. Um, there was no discussion of, uh, there were no negotiations up through 1968, right? Both the United States and Hanoi, and these are really, yes, we know you had the National Liberation Front in the South, you had the uh, Saigon regime, right? They're all claiming to be the sovereign of South Vietnam. Um, but really, the movers and shakers really are still always Hanoi and the United States, right? So the Johnson administration just simply is not no, going to negotiate with the communists, right? The demands, you know, they're just simply not going to do it, right? This, everything's a non sequitur, we're not going to do this. Same thing with Les Zuan. we're not going to negotiate in any meaningful sense because we are here to achieve our objectives, and that's it. It's, we're, we're not, we're not going to have that. Um, 68, however, though, this is Lei Zuan's second failed go for broke. The first one is 64 to rapidly topple the Saigon regime before the Americans can get involved. They fail, right? The United States does get involved. They rescue the South, Viet South Vietnamese regime. 
uh, for another 10 years, they, they prop them up, but they still, they rescue them. They bring them back from the brink of defeat. The United States are involved. The war is pretty much stalemated throughout 66, 67. It grows in size and scope and intensity, right? But still, we're not able to completely eliminate the communists' threat in South Vietnam, um, nor is the communists able to really topple or significantly threaten the Americans and the South Vietnamese, who are much kind of more powerful, if you will. Um, and then 1968, the Tet Offensive is Les Wans, again, his second go for broke, right? He was, he was looking to do is kind of rock the boat. Like, it's just same thing, push back against what you can, disrupt what you can going on in the South, uh, target that anti-war movement in the United States, see what happens. Um, and although it's a tactical defeat, it is a political kind of victory for them in the long haul. But this is one of the things that opens the door for negotiations, the Paris peace talks, right? Because that's one of uh, Lyndon Johnson's things, right? He says he's going to stop rolling thunder, the strategic bombing campaign. He's going to cap the amount of troops. He's not going to run for president, as he said, right? Take another term. But then he's willing to negotiate unilaterally, if we have to, with the Hanoi regime, right? And with the communists to kind of reach some kind of negotiated settlement to the war. So both he's gone, Nixon comes in, there's some talking while fighting going on. But now, although he's chastised a little bit. Lezuan is still firmly in control, and he's negotiating and talking simply for the idea of biding time and stalling, right? To wait for an, a more uh, uh, opportune moment to kind of tip the balance of forces and hopefully get the Americans, wear them out, deny them what they want. They're just going to, you know, pick up their ball and go home. So they're negotiating and talking, uh, but for Lezuan and the hardliners in the Polar Borough, not for any true negotiated settlement in any sense. It's really a means to buy time to gain total victory in the end. Yeah, you mentioned that, that Le Duan has these kind of uh, humiliations, right, where he tries to move to the third Maoist um, uh, phase and it, it just fails, right? Right. So how does he stay in power given all of these failures? Largely because of the fact that through um, the purges of the party, the really the ability for him and Le Duc to marginalize, right, the... the um, the, the more dovish or, or pragmatic aspect or, or, or um, side of the Polipro is really what allows them to do that. Um, they're also really good at masking what's going on as well too, right? Through propaganda um, and just outright lies, right? There's a moment, right? I forget when, I think it's definitely when before Lazwan even comes to, 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 to power, right? In which uh, Ho Chi Minh tries to liberalize, if you will, North Vietnamese society. Loosen up a little bit, right? Let's get some other voices in here. But when they start getting some serious pushback, they clamp down on that. Le Zuan turns uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam into an outright police state in which all dissent is absolutely crushed, right? Brutally put down. They're not going to have any part of that. Soldiers that are going on to fight in the South, they, they don't tell them you're going to fight other Vietnamese. They say you're going to fight imperialists, right? You're going to fight the Americans and uh, you know, traders and collaborators who are working with them. So that's never portrayed right, to the soldiers in the north who went down south in, in tremendous numbers to die, right? that they were tr fighting other Vietnamese, right? that you were fighting the Americans, this is why you're down there. They also were really good at controlling the image of the war among their own population. Uh, they never reported the true numbers of soldiers that were being killed down there. They refused to allow injured or convalescing soldiers back up to North Vietnam so that they can see these kinds of things. So they really controlled what people were allowed to see, not only internationally, right, obviously through propaganda and, you know, being able to, to mask what they were able to do, um, but also domestically in North Vietnam as well, too. So this is something that really allows the hardliners to maintain power. It's kind of marginalizing anybody who would be outspoken against them and then creating this kind of image, which really oftentimes was not in, you know, didn't comport with reality and how really, you know, damaging and destructive this conflict was to um, the people in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, particularly the young soldiers. Yeah, it sounds like the, the, throughout all of this, the reason that the, the Hanoi regime won was that they were able to control the narrative right. in, in both of these wars. Right, absolutely. I mean, it, it all worked together, right? You, it, it was this synthesis, right, of these different types of struggle, right? The military struggle was there, right? The fact that they were able to field formidable militaries, right, be they, you know, regular forces, be they Viet Cong regular forces or North Vietnamese Army regulars or the irregulars, right? The fact they were able to field effective forces uh, was something that constantly kept the Americans and the South Vietnamese on their toes, right? And really stretched out, right? Due to kind of 
Um, you know, yes, even after they were fighting conventionally, in some sense, it was still this hybrid war in which they relied really on hit and run, right? 90% of the times, the communists dictated the terms, right? They would attack, they would hit hard, and they would take off, right? Um, they used base areas not only throughout South Vietnam, things that had existed throughout the war. We were just simply not able to root these things out, right? And when you talk um, around the Saigon area, they had extensive tunnelings, you know, uh, going on as well, too, which also protected their troops. So they were able to use these safe bases, these safe havens, uh, have these forces come out, uh, hit the South Vietnamese and Americans and kind of retreat. Um, so this military effort was really critical to them. The political effort was always really was also really critical. Although the National Liberation Front really loses some of its credibility after uh, the, the Tet Offensive, right in '68, particularly due to their 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 their, their massacre in Hue, all right. But also because the government after Tet is increasingly able to establish control, largely because the insurgency takes such a beating. Um, and this is the thing: when you if you went out into the countryside. Right in South Vietnam, there were po always pockets. Right, you had some areas which were really committed to the revolution and the the communists, and they tended to be those provinces and districts that were committed to the Viet Minh against the French. Right, you had other areas who were not necessarily committed to the government, but maybe a, bit, a little bit more invested. So it depended on really where you were, which side of the fence they were on. But at the most part, your average Vietnamese kind of peasant, if you will. Um, the vagaries of Marxism-Leninism were just as alien to them as kind of liberal democracy, if you will, right? right. Markets and, and democratic practices. So for them, it was really who was in control is where their allegiances lay. This idea of hearts and minds is simply not true. It's really who is in control, who is offering kind of tangible benefits on a local level, right? Had a, had a lot to play as well, too. But nonetheless, this political movement, at least early on, with land, land reform, redistributing land, um, really being able to cast, and at least enough of the South Vietnamese population that the South Vietnamese government, the, the Saigon regime was really corrupt. They were just nothing but a neo-imperialist, right, kind of regime. This really kept them, allowed them to survive as well, too. This infrastructure was something that survived, which is really good. Um, so that was also another key critical component as well, too. The ability to keep this political movement going in the South, despite tremendous hardships, despite the, you know, large, you know, indifference among a large swath of the population. Um, but then this diplomatic uh, initiative, this is really where it, where it lay, right? The fact that they were able to stretch this out and really create what the United States was doing in Vietnam as evil and wrong, right? Um, this is something that worked for them. Um, in Congress here in the United States, among elements of the anti-war movement. Uh, now, granted, I think a lot of historians have overblown right, the appeal of the anti-war movement because it wasn't universal and it wasn't huge, right? There was pushback against it, but they just, same thing, they were able to sustain it enough, keep that constant grinding, you know, kind of, this is a war of attrition, right? An ideological war of attrition, if you will, but um, it really, uh, you know, wears away, right? Nixon, his whole Vietnamization withdrawal, he's withdrawing no matter what, right? And that's right. in response to this anti-war movement and the unpopularity of the war, right? He tries to go for broke and prosecute it early on, but he's still kind of, you know, pushing for this as well, too. But it really, in the end, uh, Congress says we've had enough of this. It's after Watergate, after, you know, Nixon is gone, but nonetheless, and the American people, I think, by that point are not willing to reintervene, if you will, once American extracts itself. So, that. Yeah, and there's there's also kind of an interesting coda here, which is, you know, before the decade is out, uh, Vietnam is fighting a war with Cambodia and China. Right. So how does that factor in as well? Um, I mean, it thre it's, it's concerning, and this is another thing too, later on, when, when they actually, when Hanoi signs, when they actually do now enter into a peace agreement for a negotiated settlement, again, right? Lai now, the 1972 Nguyen Hue, or Easter Offensive, again, another, this is the third go for broke, that fails, right? Um, now he's willing, you know what, we have to buy time now, because this was largely a North Vietnamese army show, right? It was a conventional invasion from the north. Uh, the uh, communists are, are fully equipped. They're a thoroughly modern army with tanks and, and, and all kinds of other, you know, modern equipment. Uh, however, it gets pushed back, right? So this time, Lezuan is willing to negotiate or enter into serious negotiations. Meanwhile, 
they're trying to expand their footprint in South Vietnam as much as possible, as is the Saigon regime, plant their flags in as many villages and hamlets as possible. So once the clock runs out, the, the in-place ceasefire gets put in, you can claim that you're here or there or wherever it might be. You're claiming you're in the control of this much jurisdiction. So um, late in 72, though, however, they start wondering, are we going to do this, right? There's, there's the, 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 the talks all of a sudden stall, right? And famously, Kissinger comes back and says, peace in our, not peace in our time, that was Chamberlain. Uh, peace is at hand, right? <laughs> but he comes in, and then all of a sudden, the negotiations break off again. This is what prompts Nixon to unleash linebacker and linebacker to the Christmas bombings, which are brutal. This opens up the strategic bombing to places that were heretofore not bombed, right, including Hanoi and Haiphong, right? So the devastation is, is absolutely massive in scale, the destruction based on, on this bombing. Uh, all, the, all the kind of gains that North Vietnam had made in their economy by this kind of northern first policy, plus the war was never fought there, right? So they were right. able to do this, right? All those gains are almost negated, right, through the Christmas bombings. And this is the thing that really now, Lezuan agrees, we are going to negotiate, we will do this. So he signs it, but again, right, he's just, he knows, right, the Americans are leaving, he's gonna bide his time, he's just gonna get his resources up. Uh, for that next push. But meanwhile, as you point out, there are issues going on uh, in Cambodia, um, in Laos, right? And then, of course, um, you know, with, with kind of power struggles where the Chinese things start souring as well, too. So this is something for them that's also disconcerting, right? It's the idea that um, you have these other regional powers who now, all of a sudden, despite the fact that they're kind of socialist brethren, right, that there are still kind of nationalistic tendencies here, and that for them is a dangerous proposition as well, too. Yeah, and you have this bizarre kind of situation where you have communists in Vietnam fighting other communists, right. the Khmer Rouge, right. and then the Chinese intervene, and now you have another war where you essentially have three communist countries fighting each other. Right, right. And it's the whole thing that gets Benedict Anderson down his route of, like, what is nationalism all about, right? Because right, that's the opening, I think, of that book where he's like, how do these two right, right. same ideologies go to war with one another, right? Um, so yeah, yeah, and uh, the North Vietnamese Army, the, 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 the People's Army of Vietnam, they do pretty well, right? Uh, they're in Cambodia for quite a while as well, too. And then, yeah, yeah in 79, um, they fight the Chinese and inflict a pretty serious military defeat on them as well, too. So um, Douglas Pike called uh, the People's Army of Vietnam the Prussians of Asia based upon their militancy and the fact that uh, even as far as the early 80s, they had something like the sixth world's sixth largest army, right? So they were constant, they were on a war footing. And that was largely that, even on the fact that they defeated South Vietnam, the Americans were gone, that they had now these other regional actors, uh, fellow socialist uh, nations that they were fighting as well. Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it's a deep and interesting look at a fascinating period of history. So thank you for being with us. No, no, thanks very much. This is fantastic. Thanks for listening to me talk. <laughs>